At the AP Institute I attended this summer, my fellow teachers and I puzzled over why the College Board included no works of art from the Minoan or Mycenaean civilization and three works from the Etruscan civilization. Four, uh, if you count the Temple of Ve as a separate work from the uh, Statue of Apollo. Well, the Etruscans taught the Romans to divine the future and the mysterious will of the gods by looking at the entrails, or guts, of disemboweled sacrificial animals, particularly at their livers. Since I don't plan to become an augur, that's what the priests who performed this ritual were called, I will not try to fathom the mysteries of the college board. And whatever my occasional irritation with the College Board's experts, I think disemboweling would be a trifle extreme. Anyway, I don't mind. Etruscan art is fascinating and deserves a day of our time. Someday, when you travel to Rome, you should check out the Etruscan Museum. It's one of my favorites, and I have a lot of favorites in Rome. The mural you see here, by the way, is from the so-called Tomb of the Augurs, and it illustrates these rather gory rituals. Julius Caesar, along with many other Romans, was a big believer in entrail signs. Anyway, let's watch a brief video clip to get an introduction to the Etruscans. I'm leaving out the last two minutes, which talk about how the Etruscans introduced the Romans to gladiatorial combat and to sewer systems. As always, it's all up on Moodle. So here's a map that shows ancient Etruria, which was concentrated in the northern Italian region that today we call Tuscany, after the Etruscans. The height of Etruscan culture was approximately 800 to 500 BCE, that is, about the same period as the Archaic period in Greece. Like the Greeks, the Etruscans lived in city-states that often fought each other, a major reason why the Romans were able to throw off their Etruscan king in 509 a BCE, and to decisively conquer the Etruscans in the centuries after that. But the Roman conquest poses some serious problems for our understanding of the Etruscan culture. We only have a few fragments of Etruscan writing, and to linguists, the language remains largely undeciphered. There are a few uh, simultaneous translations with Greek that make it possible to pick out some of the words, but a lot of it we don't know. So, we have to rely on the Greeks and the Romans to tell us about the Etruscans. And as you've just heard, a lot of what they had to say was not very flattering. But if imitation is truly the sincerest form of flattery, then the Romans admired the Etruscans more than they let on. Roman religion, Roman engineering, and Roman architecture in particular owe a lot to the Etruscans. The video mentioned that much of the Etruscan wealth came from metalworking. The College Board did not include any metal art on the list, but I've thrown in a few here because I think the workmanship is so exquisite. Since we can't rely on written Etruscan history and don't want to rely entirely on disapproving Roman historians, much of what we learn about Etruscans we learn from their tombs. The Etruscans buried their dead, or at least their wealthy dead, in elaborate, partly sunken round tombs called tumuli. Tumulus is the singular. A large concentration of these tumuli outside the major cities was called a necropolis. As you can sort of see from the photo on the bottom right, these cities of the dead were indeed laid out as cities, with rows of what looked like streets. The tombs themselves resembled houses for the living. They had beds, armchairs, drinking cups, pitchers, knives, even stone pillows. So let's watch just the first minute or so of a virtual tour of this tomb. The rest will be up on Moodle, as always. So now we come to the first of our required works, the Tomb of the Triclinium, discovered in the necropolis of Monterozzi near Tarquinia. The tomb consists of a single room. The fresco on the back wall shows a banquet with diners resting on three cline, K-L-I-N-E-I, -E probably should have put that word on the slide, or couches. Triclinium simply means three couches. It's a little hard to see, but under the couches a cat is, maybe, stalking a rooster and a partridge. Art historians believe that the Etruscan murals were heavily influenced by the banquet scenes that were popular on red-figure Greek pottery. So this Greek red-figure crater was made a half a century after the tomb, but you can see important stylistic similarities. And what are some of these? 
Well, the pose is very similar with the faces in profile, with the frontal eye, and the body's turned into three quarters view. We have some sense of movement and interaction, but the poses are quite stylized. Notice also that we see a musical instrument. There are lots of musical instruments on the walls of the tomb of the triclinium. So, what big difference do you notice? And the video should have clued you into this one. Well, in the Greek banquet scene or symposium, the only woman is there to entertain the male diners. In the Etruscan funerary banquet, by contrast, a man and a woman are dining together. So how can we tell that we're seeing a man and a woman? It was a convention of Etruscan art, like Minoan art, to depict women with much lighter skin than men. So on the left wall of the tomb, we see three female dancers, one male dancer and a male musician, placed between small trees filled with birds. Again, this reminds me somewhat of the Minoan frescoes, uh, including the natural elements, the landscape elements, although they're highly stylized. I couldn't find an image of this. I'm guessing it's too badly corroded, but the entry wall of the tomb of Triclinium shows two youths jumping down from horses. What's interesting about that is that art historians think they may be apobates or gladiators, as these violent games were often performed for funerals. I mentioned, I think, that the Romans picked up their taste for violent spectator sports from the Etruscans. So let's pause for a comparative moment. Here we have essentially two tomb paintings, although the Etruscan painting is a wall fresco and the Egyptian Book of the Dead is painted on a papyrus scroll. Still, both cultures believed strongly in an afterlife and they buried their dead with all the comforts they would need in their next home and to take to their next home. So what sets the Etruscans apart from the Egyptians, just judging from the art? Well, the Egyptian painting is highly moralistic. A good life after death must be earned. We don't see this element in the Etruscan painting, although, again, we don't have written history the way we do with the Egyptians to give us, if you will, the story that goes with the paintings. Note, too, that both paintings are a celebration of the life and status of the deceased. The banquets and games that accompany Etruscan funerals also showcase the family's social status while sending the deceased off with food, drink, and utensils to keep on partying in the afterlife. And it's hard not to conclude that the Etruscans simply expected to have more fun in the hereafter than the Egyptians did. Maybe we're a little less, maybe we're a little less likely to cast judgment on a person's behavior on earth as well, although again, we can't be sure without documents. So it's hard not to think the same is true of our devoted couple. They genuinely enjoyed each other, and they expected to continue enjoying each other in the afterlife. Note that this is an additive sculpture. It is made of clay, not stone. Terracotta had some important advantages. It was easier to mold clay than to carve stone, and it was easier to create a smooth surface for applying paint. It's also worth noting that the Etruscans did not have the same access to marble and other stones that the Romans had. You caught the information that this would have been fired in segments and then united, right? I think we're naturally drawn to this couple and what seems to be their obvious enjoyment of one another. But is this truly a naturalistic work? Well, we don't know what the couple looked like, but this appears to be quite stylized. The man and woman have very similar facial features, including almond-shaped eyes, uh, arched eyebrows, and of course that archaic smile. Their positioning, while affectionate, is really quite unnatural. No one could bend at the waist like that, at least not smile at the same time. The fingers and toes are too long and narrow. Still, there's no getting around the animation that the figures convey, even at rest, even after death. So here's some further evidence that the work is highly stylized. This is another sarcophagus of the spouses, this one from the Louvre Museum in Paris. By the way, this is the Louvre's own image, and I couldn't get a clearer one, sorry. But notice how similar the facial features in the two sarcophagi are, especially the men, and also how similar the poses are. So here are some comments from the Louvre website that I think would apply to both works. 
The couple are reclining on cushions in the form of wineskins, which is a reference to the sharing of wine, a ceremony that was part of the funerary ritual. I had never heard that before. The deceased woman is pouring a few drops of perfume into her husband's hand, another essential component of funerary ritual. In her left hand, she is holding a small round object. We no longer have the object in the one that's our required work, but it might be a pomegranate a symbol of immortality. It could also be a drinking cup as part of the wine ritual or a perfume bottle. By the way, some sarcophagi were found with human remains and some with ashes. It appears that the Etruscans used both burial and cremation. So there's a reason that most of the Etruscan art that has survived was found in tombs. The protected environment helped keep the frescoes and terracotta from deteriorating. Etruscan temples, which were made mostly of mud brick or volcanic stone and wood, were not as lucky. So what we know of these temples, we know from later Greek and Roman writers, and especially from Vitruvius. Before I go on, let me note that you're going to be writing an essay about Greek, Etruscan, and Roman temples at the end of the class. So you have a separate notes page with images and floor plans. You'll be able to use any of your notes on the essay I recommend, hint, hint, that you focus on similarities and differences. So you've seen Greek temples, including the Parthenon. What is different about this Etruscan cella? That, remember, is the place where the cult statue of the gods was housed. While it's divided into three parts, scholars think this cella contained three cult statues for Minerva, that's the Roman version of Athena, and also for Jupiter, that's Zeus, and Juno, that's Hera. The Etruscan names, by the way, were different. Apulu, A-P-U-L-U, is what's usually used for Apollo. At any rate, they were closer, as you can tell, to the, uh, to the Roman versions than to the Greek. The cella and indeed the temple are also closed off in the back, whereas in Greek temples, the cella and cult statue were designed to be approached from all sides. Finally, one ascends to this temple. It is much higher off the ground than a Greek temple with its relatively low stylobate or temple floor. Now, one reason for the higher entryway might be location. So where did the Greeks tend to build their temples? They tried to build them when they could on top of high hills on an necropolis. The Etruscans and the Romans after them built their temples down in the fora, that is, in the urban centers. I should note, by the way, that the Greeks did also uh, put temples in their agora. But the big temples were, were on the hillsides overlooking the towns. So in order to raise the temple above the city and toward the heavens, the Etruscans and after them, the Romans, had to put their temples on a higher platform. We see that the Etruscan temple, this is a model. These did not survive, only the foundations and the descriptions. But we see that the front portico or porch had Tuscan rather than uh, Doric columns. So how do they differ? Well, the Tuscan columns have bases. They are not fluted. They were also made of wood or sometimes of tufa stone rather, uh, rather than marble. And of course, the Greeks tended to put their sculpture into friezes on the pediment or on the entablature, the triglyphs and metopes, or the continuous frieze in an ionic style. The Etruscans placed their terracotta sculptures on the roof. When it comes to function, however, I should note that the Greeks, Etruscans, and later the Romans tended to use their temples in the same way, to house cult statues of the gods. The temple building was only part of the templum, that T-E-M-P-L-U-M, that's the defined sacred space that included the building, the altar, other sacred grounds, sometimes a sacred grove of, of trees or a sacred spring, uh, and the altar used for sacrifice and ritual ceremonies in all three cultures, Greek, Etruscan, Roman, was located outside the temple. I've mentioned that Etruscan ceremonies focused heavily on ceremonial slaughtering of animals and subsequent interpretation of their innards. This was an important element in Roman temple worship as well. The Etruscans may have actually picked this up from their trade ties with the ancient Near East. We know from historical rep records that the Babylonians performed these rituals, especially uh, with the uh, with the liver. The Greeks did the same, but they were not as obsessed with livers and other innards as the Etruscans or the Romans. 
Uh, just one more little detail about Etruscan temples that I found. To further protect the roof beams from rain, insects, and birds, the end of each column of roof tiles, they were terracotta tiles, was capped by an ornament known as an antifix, A-N-T-E-F-I-X. I should have put that on the slide, but I don't think you really need to know it. These flat ornaments were usually made with terracotta from a mold, and they were sometimes made of stone. The antifixes would be brightly painted, and they often depicted female and male faces. The male faces uh, tended to be representations of the Etruscan equivalent of Dionysus, the god of wine and merriment, right? And many of the female figures were representation of the Gorgon, the lady with the snake hair who turned people who saw her to stone. Uh, here's an example of one of the Gorgons. The antifixes were meant to ward off evil and protect the temple site. But notice that there was sculptural ornamentation on an Etruscan temple in addition to those sculptures sculptures on the roof. So only a few of the rooftop terracotta sculptures have survived. This one is probably the most famous, and it's another of your required works. Some art historians, and apparently the College Board, believe that Volca Avei was the sculptor. He is associated with the workshop that produced terracotta sculpture, and we know about him from the Roman writer Pliny, who tells us that in the late 6th century BCE, an Etruscan artist named Volca was summoned from Vei to Rome to decorate the most important temple there, a temple to Jupiter Optimus Maxima. So do you remember who the guy on the left is, the one missing his head and why he's hanging out with Apollo? Sorry, it's a little blurry. I captured it from the video. Well, the sculptures on the temple rooftop played out a scene from mythology, the third labor of Hercules. Hercules was sent out to capture the golden hind, a deer with golden horns. Artemis, or Diana, valued the golden hind, and she and her brother Apollo wanted it back. Hercules promised to return it, as soon as he showed it to the king and got credit to, uh, for completing his assigned labor. So that's Hercules missing his head. Notice, by the way, that he's even more dynamically portrayed than Apollo, as probably befits an action hero. So here we see the Apollo next to the archaic Anavisos Kuros and a reconstruction of the cult statue of Athena from the Parthenon. Note Athena's size. Uh, this reproduction is based on descriptions by ancient sources and, by the way, it lives at the Art Museum in Nashville. So what's the main difference that you notice? Well, our Etruscan god is on the move. He uses negative space in a way that we won't see in Greek sculpture for a few more decades. The body is clearly delineated or highly stylized, as is the drapery. Uh, and notice he has drapery, as does Athena, but that the Kouros does not. Our Apollo is also gazing more directly at Hercules, which means we get the impression that he's looking at us as well. He's not just looking into a generalized space the way the Kouros is. On the other hand, his face has a goofy, archaic smile. Our Khan Academy historians think it's a more animated and engaging version of the smile. It may partly be that this is a god uh, chewing out Hercules and not uh, a statue of a dead warrior. Remember that all of these statues would have been garishly painted, and of course, Athena was covered in gold and ivory. I didn't mention this back when we did the Parthenon, but that mixture is known as Chris Elephantine. You probably wouldn't have to know that word, but now you do. Note, by the way, that the Apollo is slightly larger than life, but the Athena is huge. Of course, it was a cult statue, while the Apollo was a rooftop sculpture. The cult statue from the temple has not survived. It may well have been made of precious metal or wood covered with metal and melted down by looters at some point. Okay, this is where we get a little ahead of ourselves. The College Board has used this image a lot in the past, but it's no longer on the list. Still, the Maison Carré is the best preserved Roman temple that we have. It's based on a temple that the Emperor Augustus built in Rome. Augustus, as we'll learn soon, was a huge fan of Greek art, and he deliberately set out to evoke the golden age of Pericles. So what Greek elements do you see here? Well, there's a clear pediment. Uh, the columns are Corinthian style that the Romans favored, but the Roman temples also borrowed many features from the Etruscans. And which ones do you see here? Well, the temple has a pseudo peripteral facade. That means it has Greek style freestanding columns in front, but engaged columns on the back and side. So this is not open all the way around the way a Greek temple is. Similarly, we see that deep front porch. Uh, the portico, and the much higher platform. Again, this was built in a forum, not an acropolis. 
Here are photos of the three temples, the Etruscan temples, of course, a model based on Vitruvius's description. And here we see the three floor plans. You have these on your handout. So here's the question that appeared on the 2007 exam. Since the Maison Carré is not a required work, you wouldn't get this precise question. I still think it's possible you might be given this image and asked to identify the Etruscan and Greek elements. Here's the short essay you're going to write now. Label the parts of your answer 1, 2, and 3, but please write in complete sentences and remember to use your specialized art history vocabulary, right?